Hello, people of YouTube. Welcome. It's me. It's Andrew Fantasia. And it's Friday, which means it's casual Friday. That's why I'm not dressed in a suit, because if it was formal Friday, we'd be having a totally different conversation. Welcome aboard here on Digital Charcuterie. As always, if you like this video, give it thumbs ups, give it subscribes, give it bells. Uh, don't give it bells. Just ring bells. Please do not send us bells. We have enough. We're good. Uh, also, if you like us and you like me and you like fantasy, maybe consider checking out my fantasy series that I self-published, and it's on Amazon right now. It's called We Were Wizards, and you got these two books available right now on Amazon. We Were Wizards Part 1 is this purple one, and then the next one in line is this silver one, and they're both sleek and sexy and gorgeous and just full of fantasy goodness with swords and magic and elves and dragons and stuff. Uh, look, there's a... There's a Spoilery preview right there. Ooh, what's going on? There's something written in bold. You're going to have to zoom in on that if you want to see more. And if you want to see the rest of it, you're going to have to pick those up on Amazon.com. You can get them in hardcover like this, or you can get them in paperback or even ebook if that's what you prefer. So check out We Were Wizards. It would help me out a lot. Leave reviews too on Amazon if you like them. Even if you don't like them, leave reviews. And uh, for the fantasy fan in your life, you can't go wrong. So today on Casual Friday, we have just a couple little things to chat about together. Um, and I want to start with Ari Aster. Ari Aster is uh, one of the, you know, new kind of avant-garde horror directors who's been making a name for himself over the past decade, right? We've had people like Jordan Peele, uh, like Robert Eggers, and Ari Aster kind of rounds out that Holy Trinity, more or less. Uh, they all have now officially had three big horror movies under their belt. And Ari Aster has directed Hereditary and Midsommar, which, depending on who you ask, are two of the best horror films of the past decade, particularly Hereditary. A lot of people just cannot get enough of how good Hereditary is. I personally really, really liked it, but I like... Midsommar even more. I thought Midsommar was very um, shocking and just did things I didn't expect and went places I'd never been taken. Uh, and very, very dark, disturbing, frightening, skin crawling kind of movies. Uh, so Ari Aster's third movie, Bo is Afraid, is finally out. And I wanted to talk a little bit All right, that's better. Something happened with my microphone uh, because why should the internet ever work perfectly? So just to rewind, we are going to be talking about Bo is Afraid, the new Ari Aster movie, but we're not gonna be spoilery about it. However, I am going to caution you that I will be spoilery about the tone of Bo is Afraid. I will be spoilery about the kind of filmmaking and the kind of storytelling that Bo is Afraid utilizes. So as you may or may not have heard, you know, if Ari Aster and his movies interest you, and if you've had this film on your radar, which I think quite a bit of you have, I remember James talking about it on the channel before. Um, if you've been keeping track, you would know that the reviews for this film have been kind of wild, right? People have been smiling ear to ear and saying it's a stroke of brilliance and it's almost like a practical joke played on the audience and they love it for that. Other people are saying they walked out of the theater and they thought it was pure garbage and that Ari Aster's career as a filmmaker is over. Um, I am somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, I guess, because the way this movie works is beautiful and it's artistic and it's intelligent but it's not quite for me and I don't know maybe that means I'm not beautiful or artistic or intelligent and hey if them's the breaks them's the breaks but 
the way I feel about art, when it, when it comes to cinema in general, when it comes to film, if you are going to use surrealism as a sort of main talking point in your piece of art, right? Surrealism is a totally viable method of getting your art across. But if you are going to use surrealism, you, in my opinion anyway, you need a baseline of normalcy to guide you along that road. The best, uh, best way I can describe it is like this. If a story rooted in surrealism is a giant churning ocean, just waves churning everywhere, right? If that's what surrealism is, you as a director or a writer or whatever, you need to give the audience a piece of driftwood. It doesn't have to be huge, it doesn't have to be a whole ship. It can literally be just a door like in Titanic. Just something that they can cling to that they can know this is real so that they can contrast and compare it to the swirling dark waves around them. And that driftwood can be um, a character who kind of behaves the way a real character would and takes everything in with a sense of, oh my God, what's happening? Everything's so weird. You know, it could be a character. It could be uh, a just a setting, like a place that the story happens to take place in. It, there just needs to be, I mean, this is just my opinion, there needs to be driftwood in order to fully enjoy the surreal waters that you want to plunge us into. Uh, and it's, it's kind of an apt metaphor because Bo is afraid really has a lot of, uh, water is a big motif throughout the film. It recurs a lot. Uh, but Bo is afraid at the end of the day, doesn't have any driftwood. At least none that I could see with my dumb eyes and my dumb old brain. It was just waves. It was just, ooh, look how weird we are. Ooh. It was that for three hours. And that's not my cup of tea, all right? I want a little piece of driftwood in my tea. I want like a little sliver of graham cracker so that I know where the real world stops and the tea begins. So people are going to love or hate Bo is Afraid depending on their tolerance for the surreal and the absurd, depending on how big a piece of driftwood they need. The more driftwood you feel like you need to navigate those kinds of waters, the more you are going to hate Bo is Afraid because that driftwood is non-existent. And it's a shame because that film has a lot of parts that I really, really liked. There's a lot of awesome stuff peppered throughout this three hour odyssey of a movie. But I don't think it was enough for me to say that I enjoyed the experience. And, you know, long movies, you all know how I feel. I love long movies. Uh, James will disagree, but that's okay. But there are long movies that feel like they go by like that. I'm looking at you, Avengers Endgame, and I'm looking at you, it's a mad, 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 mad world. But then there are long movies that you sit there and you're like, oh my God, this is still going. And Bo is Afraid was one of those. So the, uh, you know, not to make this a review show, but I just wanted to kind of touch on that because it is kind of the hot button film right now. And it will be for the next week until Guardians of the Galaxy comes out. But I wanted to see it. I wanted to give it a chance because it's Ari Aster and I love his work and I wanted to always give a new chance to new IPs, right? New original films and scripts. So of course I'm going to do that. That's why I also have plans next week to go see, uh, what are those two new movies called? I have them written down right here because they looked exciting to me. Sisu and Polite Society. Those two looked really fun. And they're, from what I can tell, original films. So of course I want to go support them. So I gave Bo's Afraid that chance. It did not live up to my Ari Aster expectations and it did not just live up to my in general hopes 
for a film like this. And I kind of knew what I was getting into going into it because of what everybody was saying, but I kind of hoped just that solid driftwood under my feet would be a little bit sturdier and it really wasn't. The best praise that I can give this film, and it is praise because I do like what Aster did with it, is if you've ever had one of those dreams slash nightmares where you're in your head, in your dream, you know you have to get to point B, right? Your dream is telling you, you have to go do this at point B. And every time you try to get to point B, things keep happening and sidelining you and you never end up getting there. Bo is Afraid is an absolutely flawless three hour visual representation of that kind of dream. Best way I can put it. So that's how I felt about that film. Enter at your own risk for sure. Please don't bring the kids. Please, you know, go alone. This is a very uncomfortable movie to sit next to somebody with. Um, but yeah, that's Bo's Afraid. I'm afraid. So a couple of email questions have come in. We're going to go over those right now, starting with a question from Logan Androya. Hi, Logan. So Logan is asking, just watching your video on Nicolas Cage and The Flash, do you think they'll digitally place Christopher Reeves' face on another actor for another Superman? Thank you for your question, Logan. Um, do I think they're going to do that? I mean, the short answer is absolutely not. No, I think that they have, look, when Rogue One came out, people across the board love Rogue One. I absolutely loved that they CGI'd Tarkin, Peter Cushing, into that film. I thought he looked amazing. But I feel like I'm in the minority because everybody else I talk to, even though they love Rogue One, says they hated that. And that was a character that, let's face it, even among Star Wars fans, is not all that iconic. Right? It's Tarkin. He's not uniconic, but he's just, he's kind of middle of the road. Like, who cares? It's, it's Will Huff Tarkin, right? At the end of the day, that's no skin off anybody's back if you do something that tarnishes the good name of Will Huff Tarkin. Superman, that's a whole different animal. That is a completely different story. People are so protective of Superman to the point where it gets frightening. I mean, you've seen what these people on Twitter have been saying, some of these basement-dwelling edgelords that have crawled through the Twitter woodworks um, since Henry Cavill has been let go, right? The people who are talking about firing Henry Cavill as, like, a sin on par with anything Hitler did. And I think those same weirdos were making the same amount of complaints when there was talk of casting a black Superman, right? They were, again, up in arms about that. So there is a weird, scary, protective pocket of the internet that doesn't like anything left of center happening with the character of Superman. Christopher Reeve, um, I mean, he made four movies. Depending on who you ask, he made two good ones. Um, and then his time passed. He stopped being Superman. So even if those weird pockets of Twitter did not exist, even if those weirdos were not, you know, sending death threats to James Gunn on a regular basis, I don't think anybody would even dream of CGI in Christopher Reeve's face just because... I feel like it would leave a bad taste in people's mouths. As much as this Flash movie really feels like it's um, trying to pull from the greatest hits of DC films, those Superman movies feel so far removed from everything that they are, they kind of stand on their own. And 
Christopher Reeve's legacy kind of stands on its own that I, I feel like they just don't want to go there. They really don't. Nicolas Cage possibly showing up, I think would be more widely accepted because that's a Superman we never got to see, right? That was, I believe it was supposed to be called Superman Flyby, uh, the J.J. Abrams idea that he had. Um, but to see Nicolas Cage step into that role is kind of like how we got to see Krasinski step into the shoes of Reed Richards for that one little cameo. It's fan service acknowledging a real world thing that's never going to happen, but just paying it some tribute. That is something that everybody can get behind. Very few people will watch that on the screen and say, I hated that they did that. I hated that they threw in that Nicolas Cage Superman cameo. Conversely, many people would see a Christopher Reeve thing and flip out, right? So I think what they want to do, especially considering that uh, Ezra Miller is not the most uh, happy-go-lucky name in Hollywood right now, they want to ruffle as few feathers as possible with this film, and they want it to be a smooth transition from this into whatever the new DC world is going to look like. So they don't want to add any more bumps to this road than there already have been. So I would say, Logan, that uh, if, if you want to see Superman as Christopher Reeve, just go back and watch those four movies, because I don't think it's happening anytime soon in the Sandy Muschietti Flash film. However, we never got to see, in my opinion, we have never seen a great cinematic Lex Luthor. And I think it was a crime, a literal crime, that Gene Hackman played Lex Luthor in the 70s instead of Telly Savalas because he would have been perfect. So if the Flash movie wants to give us a CGI Telly Savalas Lex Luthor cameo, I'm not going to complain. Just saying. Thank you so much for your question, Logan. And our last question, our final topic of Casual Friday today comes from Annalise Dumfrey. Hi, Annalise. Annalise asks, what would you do about Majors, Jonathan Majors? Would you recast, and if so, who? Or just get rid of Kang and make Doctor Doom the big bad? Thanks for your question, Annalise. Ah, oh, boy. The Jonathan Majors predicament. Of course, you know, this has to, this news drops in the middle of like, you know, in 2023, in three months, Jonathan Majors has had three major blockbusters. He's had Devotion, Creed 3, and Quantumania. Like he is the star of 2023. And then all of a sudden we find out that he's not so nice a person, apparently, allegedly. I don't know. I hope this all ends up not being true. But if it all ends up being true, and if he is in fact what these people are saying that he is, honestly, if I was in charge, uh, and I am, no, uh, but if I was in charge of the MCU, too much has already been invested in the character of King, especially considering the last thing we have ever gotten in the MCU ended by showing us what a big deal Kang is, right? There, were, there was a whole movie about how he's a huge villain and two post credit scenes about we don't even have an idea of how huge a villain he is yet because we haven't even met all the versions of him. That whole movie is just a, a introduction to you are getting a lot of Kang. That was the thesis of that film. So the idea of swapping it out with Dr. Doom, which I hear a lot on Twitter, that sounds so stupid. I know people want Dr. Doom. Of course, we all want a good Dr. Doom because, hey, that's another villain like Lex Luthor who has not had a good cinematic representation. There is no good Dr. Doom in any movie. So, of course, we want the good doctor to show up. But no, absolutely not. Do not backtrack and erase all of this work that you have done by, and throw in Dr. Doom. I am unapologetically in love with the MCU. It's beautiful. It's what I've wanted since I was a little kid. And I have no problem with 
phase four. Phase four did not bother me the way it seemed to bother so, so many other people because it has, you know, since last year it has become cool to not like Marvel anymore. So more people are joining in and saying, yeah, I hate it too. I hate She-Hulk so much just because it's become cool to say so, right? Um, I have never been that guy. I have pretty much been loving everything we've been getting. And the thing about storytelling, and I hate to sound condescending here, but I'm talking, please under, understand, I'm not talking to everybody here. I'm talking specifically to those people who become whiny babies on Twitter about the MCU. I'm, I'm zeroing in on you right now. This is where my condescension is targeted. Everybody else, don't take this personally. The thing about storytelling, especially long form storytelling, and this is coming from a person who has spent his life storytelling, okay? This is why I'm able to say this in this tone of voice. It's about planting seeds that pay off eventually. That's how storytelling works. Just because phase four doesn't give you exactly what you wanted when you wanted it does not make it bad. It means that the people in charge of the grand plan of whatever the multiverse saga story is are pacing themselves according to how they, professional storytellers, believe works best to serve that story that they're telling. And that story that they're telling, considering that this is ending with a Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars thing, is heavily, uh, it heavily hinges on King the Conqueror being a huge part of it and the multiverse that he so often interacts with being a huge part of it. That's how it works, okay? It doesn't have to do with giving you the cool stuff you want because it's what you want. That's called fan fiction. And that's why fan fiction is usually garbage, okay? So with that out of the way, now I'm addressing everybody again. There have been seeds planted throughout phase four that are going towards some kind of end game moment. And Kang, we know, is a huge part of that. So re redoing it and, and throwing in Dr. Doom would be the stupidest idea they could possibly do. It would, it would be so stupid. It would be like um, showing Thanos at the end of the first Avengers and uh, integrating him and his stones and the gauntlet into all these other little movies. And then halfway through phase two saying, uh, actually we meant the lizard, not Thanos. <laughs> that is absolutely not a smart idea. They're gonna save Dr. Doom for when the time is right. And given what little I know about the Secret Wars comic, the time is probably Secret Wars. I wouldn't be surprised if Doom was the big bad of whatever Saga 3 ends up being. So if the people in charge of storytelling at the MCU have any brain cells among them whatsoever, you are not getting King swapped out for Doctor Doom. It's not going to happen. So recasting is probably the most viable option. And honestly, I don't know who I would recast at that point. Annalise, I think that if you're going to recast this character, maybe get somebody just not very well known. Because Jonathan Majors started off as an unknown. Uh, well, everybody did, Andrew. That's how acting works. But he got his, you know, all the eyes got turned to him from Lovecraft Country. That's where we first noticed, like, hey, this guy ain't half bad. And then as Lovecraft Country was happening, that's when those rumors started spreading. It was like, oh, I heard this guy might be getting cast as King the Conqueror. And sure enough, that's what happened. So find somebody who is right now in their Lovecraft Country phase. Find an actor who is in that stage of their career. And that's who you recast with. Make sure it's somebody who is malleable, though. Because Jonathan Majors is a malleable actor. He gave us two very different characters with King and he who remains, and from the looks of things, three more very different characters that I was so excited to see in Ramatut, Scarlet Centurion, and Immortus, and the other guy that you see with Loki and Mobius, whose name I forget. If you're gonna recast, it has to be somebody who can pull off all of those different characters. Maybe, some, maybe somebody who got their start 
in comedy because that gives you a broader range, but I wouldn't necessarily say that's, you know, necessary. Uh, that would be the most ideal thing. Recast and use, you have an advantage. You have a character who time travels a lot and takes on many different forms and faces. So recasting, it it's not like when they recast uh, Rhodey and you had to kind of be like, oh, okay, it was Terrence Howard, but now it's Don Cheadle. And now it's two guys who don't look anything alike. Uh, that's kind of weird, but whatever, right? It doesn't have to be like that now because you literally have a character who looks different in every iteration. So you could just kind of use that as a scapegoat. Be like, hey, that guy doesn't look like Kang. Yeah, but he's a variant. It's still Kang. And they wouldn't have anything to worry about. He is literally one of the easiest Marvel characters to recast because of what his powers and his whole deal is. So recast Kang if it's necessary. Otherwise, stick with majors if everything ends up being fine on that front. But man, what a mess this all turned out to be. The moral of the story, guys, if you don't want to create messes like this, the moral of the story is be a good person. Don't be a jackass. Don't be a jerk to people. Uh, like some of these celebrities end up being, just be a good person and none of these unfortunate messes will ever happen, right? You think we'd learn this by now? Oh boy. Well, that's Casual Friday uh, for today. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Until next time, may you be the masters of your own destiny.